Oh, hey, there's my fish bowl. I've been looking for that. Where did the fish go? Eh, you know what? It's not a pressing concern. I'm sure they'll turn up eventually. But, you know, this upside down fishbowl placed here by mysterious and unclear circumstances does remind me of a story. A personal story. A story from my childhood. A story of how 15 years ago, a little Spider-Man villain known as Mysterio changed my life forever. That's not an exaggeration. I'm being completely serious. I would not be here right now without Mysterio. I owe a lot to this weird little man. So let's talk about that. Let's finally talk about why I love Mysterio. Oh, and along the way, we might also have to address some uh, serious issues with the modern film industry, so. Yay. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and I would like to take you back to the distant past, the year 2004. Spider-Man 2 had just come out that summer, and my little 11-year-old brain was captivated like it was pizza time. The action, the excitement, the humor, this freaking shot that just destroyed my mind as every neuron in my puny baby brain overloaded trying to map the geometry of how they even did that. Once the movie was over, I knew I needed more, so I begged for things like the Lego set of the train sequence, uh, a cheap Dr. Octopus claw arm toy, and also those annoying silly string web shooters they make for like every new release of a Spider-Man movie, but the one thing I wanted more than anything else was to relive and continue the adventure I saw on the big screen by playing the Spider-Man 2 video game. So at the time I was visiting my grandparents over the summer for like a week or so, and they actively encouraged my love of superheroes, which was very nice. Uh, and they went out totally unexpectedly and bought me the Spider-Man 2 video game for Xbox. Um, small problem though, I love it, it's great. They didn't actually have an Xbox for me to play this on. Uh, my older brother had one back at our house, but I wouldn't be back there for another couple days. So. I did the only thing a young tween nerd in my position could possibly do. I read the manual. A lot, like, like a, a lot. I read this thing cover to cover all day for like two to three days at least. I wanted to learn all about the combat system. I was preemptively memorizing which objective markers meant what. I read every word about how to web swing efficiently, just trying to imagine what it would feel like in my hands as I swung around New York as Spider-Man, just as thrilling and magnificent as the movies. And I guess the scene of me reading this manual over and over again looked so pathetic that my grandpa eventually felt so sorry for me, he went out and bought an Xbox so I could actually play this game while I was there with them. And I want to clarify something. My grandparents did not buy me an Xbox. They bought themselves an Xbox and allowed me to play Spider-Man on it. What a power move. I mean, as I feverishly dove into the game, I had enormous fun. If you've ever played it, you know it was the golden standard for swinging around New York as the webhead, and it showcased a ton of Spidey's famous foes. And one of the recurring villains you battle is... People of New York, I am Mysterio. I'll determine that your plan is right for conquest. Mysterio debuted in the comics in Amazing Spider-Man number 13 from 1964 and was co-created by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Quentin Beck grew up with a love of movies, especially old sci-fi films that would push the limits of special effects. He got into the film business as a stuntman and eventually became a special effects artist. Oh, and just for clarity, uh, cause this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Special effects refers to practical, usually physical effects that are captured in camera. Anything from atmospheric effects like artificial rain, wind, and fog. 
Oh, it's so loud! It also includes things like uh, miniatures, puppets, and uh, animatronics, pyrotechnics, all of that stuff. So much smoke in here now. Basically, special effects are all of the real effects captured on set. Uh, obviously, they're not real, they are controlled, uh, movies are just elaborate lies, but you get my point. Now, when it comes to effects that are added in post-production digitally, the term for that would be visual effects, or VFX. This covers basically anything added in or altered digitally, like the use of CGI or compositing multiple visual assets together. I promise this is an important distinction for the rest of the video, I just, I needed to get it out of the way early. But anyway, Mysterio. Also, I really gotta find those fish. So Mysterio's supervillain origin has subtle variations, but they almost all boil down to the idea that Beck didn't get as much recognition for his work in the film industry as he would like. Out of anger and frustration, he creates a colorful, eccentric persona who, in his first story, uses his knowledge of special effects and movie magic to frame Spider-Man for a crime, turn the public against the webhead, and defeat him as Mysterio, New York's newer, better superhero. In the video game, Quentin Beck tested Spider-Man's skills and abilities publicly, hoping to best him, but Spidey would beat Beck's tests, humiliating the guy in front of everyone, effectively ending his career in show business. In revenge, Beck created the character Mysterio to wreak havoc on the city in hopes that he could finally prove himself superior to Spidey. But here's the thing. For most of the game, you don't actually fight Mysterio head on. He just shows up as holograms or illusions or projections. Combat was present in his levels, but it focused on drones, axe clowns, these guys are the worst, and wiggly spider clones. For the most part, just like Beck's initial tests, it centered around puzzles and how well you as the player had a handle on Spider-Man's controls. And while the controls of the game were celebrated for their time, they were just clunky enough that his levels were the toughest in the game for me personally. Continually falling off the platforms in the first stage, trying to swing to the Statue of Liberty via that pathway of unevenly distributed platforms. No, please, I'm so close. Come on! To be fair, the difficulty I had with these parts could also be because I am terrible at all video games, but I like to imagine that my experiences are universal, so I never have to think too hard about anything. A good chunk into the game, you do finally get to fight Mysterio directly after you encounter him robbing a convenience store, and honestly, it's daunting. Once again, his challenges were the hardest for me to handle, and now I'm face to face with a guy who's been causing me so much stress. The game builds up the pressure as he delivers this grand speech while you watch his health bar grow over three stages, signaling that he's going to be the fiercest enemy you've faced yet. Then, the action begins. You have trifled with my power for the last time! I will not hold back! You hit him once and he goes down. Dude. The first time I played through that part of the game, I remember just taking a moment, putting down the controller and just thinking to myself, wow, I love this game. Don't get me wrong, comedically anticlimactic moments like this were far from revolutionary in 2004, but it was done beautifully with Mysterio, and it follows precedent. Whether in comics, cartoons, or video games, Mysterio should never actually be able to compete with Spider-Man in combat. Mysterio challenges Spidey mentally, but when the two finally come face to face, he consistently goes down in one blow. It's brilliant, and if Far From Home changes that, then I'm gonna scream in the theater. There's no shortage of Spider-Man villains who use advanced gadgetry to fight the webhead. Uh, science and technology are pretty strong themes throughout early Spider-Man comics, but Mysterio, for some reason, stood out to me as I played this game, and I desperately wanted to learn more about him. In a world full of colorful theatrical characters, giving one of them a background in the film industry felt both incredibly obvious and wholly original. 
I can't remember a character ever capturing my attention the way that Mysterio did. And I'm not exaggerating here when I say that seeing this laughable villain in the Spider-Man 2 video game of all places genuinely changed the entire trajectory of my life from that point on. Before Mysterio, I never really thought about filmmaking as a career that I would be interested in, but thanks to this side character in a video game adaptation of a movie sequel, suddenly it's all I could think about. I now had a hunger for learning more about film production and special effects. So naturally, one of the first places I went to was the DVD extras for Spider-Man 2. Learning about how they brought Dr. Octopus's mechanical tentacles to life was both eye-opening and incredibly thrilling. The team behind it aimed to film as much of Doc Ock's arms practically rather than digitally, partly because the technology wasn't good enough and cheap enough to do convincing CGI in all the close-ups, but also because they knew that making them real would have a more significant impact on the audience. Yo, I mean, they're so, it's totally safe to touch it or, or play with it. Cool. That's cool. They had a dozen or so puppeteers breathing life and emotion into each of the arms, which also had their own individual names. Uh, the the tentacles each had names is what I mean, not the puppeteers, because the, the, obviously they had names as well, but that's less interesting, because like it's pretty standard for people to have names. And also presumably like their puppeteers, each of the mechanical tentacles were able to express feelings like rage, pain, and focus. It's incredibly cool. Honestly, it makes me a little bummed that if Doc Ock ever makes a comeback in a new live action Spider-Man film, you know his arms would be entirely CGI. And all that character and personality the puppeteers put into each arm might very well be lost. But from DVD extras, I branched out into watching channels like Video Copilot, Film Riot, and Indie Mogul to learn more tips and tricks about filmmaking. I didn't really have a camera to film on until I got like an, an iPod Touch near the end of high school and shot a bunch of dumb sketches on that. Boy, I really hate them. Oh God, my pudgy. Oh God. What is up with me running? Why do I run so weird? Oh look, you can see exactly where I started balding. That's fun. Don't do it. Don't speak, Scott. I'm over here. Why did I do an accent? Why did I think I could do an accent? Anyway, so from there, I started stepping into visual effects. I wanted to try my hand at practical effects, but it turns out that you need like a budget for that. And VFX is just kind of inherently cheaper. Um, so I guess I learned the exact same lesson the entire film industry also learned around that time. After high school, I went to college to study film production, and I also did some VFX work for a medieval comedy film that my school produced. I don't have any uh, footage from that, so you're just gonna have to take my word for it. But the biggest issue I faced in college while I was learning about film production is that I kind of felt like everything they were teaching me was stuff that I had already learned from watching YouTube channels about film production. It honestly felt like a waste of time going to class to like relearn stuff I felt like I already knew when instead I could use that time to make videos, to get experience, get practice doing it. So I started a YouTube channel. Uh, not this one though, not the one you're watching. No, the first one I started was called Scott's Thoughts and it was just, it was incredibly idiotic. What is that hair, my man? What is that hair? I'm gonna get a lot of jokes about how, like, I, I don't have any hair anymore, but, like, just... You... This is... I didn't deserve hair. Clearly. I hate this. I hate this. It was basically just me attempting to be funny while also talking about comics and superheroes occasionally. I started a show on there called Comic Misconceptions because I thought that was a very clever name. Thankfully, that channel doesn't exist anymore. Um, this was around the time when YouTube started integrating with Google Plus around 2013 or so, and that whole system kind of went wonky and just deleted the entire channel. Honestly, the whole thing was a bit fishy. But honestly, it was a super depressing day for me. As terrible as my videos were, I still put time and energy into them. And having them all deleted off of YouTube accidentally was just 
incredibly disheartening. However, I did use that setback as motivation to continue comic misconceptions on a new channel, a channel called NerdSync. The idea of NerdSync at the time was that it was supposed to be like a, a big hub uh, where myself and my friends would all make videos about the things that we were nerdy about. Nerd Sync, do you get it? In fact, the very first series on this channel uh, very much showcased the inspiration I took from Mysterio. Uh, just with the film stuff though, not really the villainy. You know, I need to save something for my 30s. It was a show about prop building and VFX tutorials with my buddy Josh, who was infinitely more talented than I was. Am. Are you crying? No! We tried a bunch of other kinds of videos, like terrible Let's Plays and more dumb sketches, but for some reason the videos that got the most traction were the ones where I talked about superheroes and made horrible jokes that will no doubt be used to cancel me someday. Can't wait for that! Problem was, I spent so much time making YouTube videos that I kind of stopped going to class altogether and eventually failed out of college. That, that wasn't fun to deal with. I had six months before I had to start paying off my massive student loans. And the smart thing would have been to go out and find a stable job. Uh, what I did instead was 100% commit to doing YouTube videos. I wasn't making any money at the time doing them. I just really hoped that in six months, I would be able to make it work. Thankfully, around five months later in August of 2014, one of my videos about the Guardians of the Galaxy just took off. It was completely unexpected, but it was exactly the break that I needed to continue making YouTube videos full time. Uh, which was probably for the best, because that same year, I kind of lost hope in ever becoming a Hollywood VFX artist. You see, a year prior, in 2013, there was a bit of controversy sweeping the film industry. In early 2013, the visual effects studio Rhythm & Hughes was up for two Oscars in the category of Best VFX, one for Snow White and the Huntsman, and one for Life of Pi, which ultimately won. And honestly, the entire presentation is hard to watch. From the cast of The Avengers cringingly satirizing the fact that visual effects artists don't get enough recognition and respect. It's important that visual effects artists are given the respect they deserve. This was a huge year for VFX. Well, well let's just give them the respect they deserve and give them the damn award, okay? okay? To the actual speech by the artists being cut off after less than 45 seconds by the Jaws theme. My mom and dad, thank you for telling me I could do any crazy career choice I wanted. The worst part about this situation is that Rhythm and Hughes Studios filed for bankruptcy just a few months after Life of Pi hit theaters. This was a VFX company that on paper was doing everything right creatively and keeping up with the annoying logistical pains the film industry forced on them to try and stay afloat financially. They won an Oscar! But during the speech, when VFX supervisor Bill Westenhofer brought up the fact that Rhythm and Hughes was hurting financially, this happened. Finally, I want to thank all the artists who worked on this film for over a year, <laughs> including Rhythm and Hughes. Sadly, Rhythm and Hughes is suffering se se severe financial difficulties right now. It's, I urge you all to remember. They cut the mic off. It's worth noting that Life of Pi won other awards that night, like Best Cinematography. But that speech wasn't cut off, even though Claudio Miranda talked for longer. And when Ang Lee won for Best Director, he thanked just about everyone on the planet except the visual effects artists. Everyone watching this video right now? Guess what? Ang Lee also thanked you at the Oscars that year. Unless you worked on the VFX of the film, in which case all Ang Lee did was complain about you. The end days of Rhythm and Hughes were captured in a documentary called Life After Pi that I came across in 2014, the same year I decided to take a leap away from pursuing VFX and started focusing on this YouTube channel full time. And this documentary was a big reason why I made that shift. I didn't want to go into an unstable career, so I chose YouTube instead. 
Right. And when I think back to Mysterio, the character who started me down this road that eventually spat me out right here, right now, it's almost prophetic that Stan Lee and Steve Ditko created a movie effects artist who wasn't getting the respect and recognition he thought he deserved, especially in the presence of superheroes stealing the show. But at the very least, hopefully you now know why Mysterio means so much to me and why I spend my time making videos about how comics and superheroes are important and impactful and meaningful. I gotta be honest with you, some days I really do miss the VFX side of things. I miss sitting behind a computer and spending days trying to get a shot to look cool and believable. And to feed that urge again, I've been trying to do more things in these videos over the past year or so that involve uh, more cinematic lighting or costumes or makeup and, and editing, all the things that are creatively fulfilling to me. I've been trying to get back into that again. More so than anything, I just want to improve my storytelling abilities and not just list off facts and sprinkle in a couple dumb jokes here and there like I used to with all my old videos. Like I'm proud of my old videos, I guess, like to an extent, but you know, I wanna grow, I wanna get better, improve over time, make these videos more exciting and interesting to watch. And hey, if you wanna support me getting back into that groove that was inspired by Mysterio of all people, uh, consider supporting me on Patreon. At the very least, I hope you've enjoyed this behind the scenes look at the journey that started this YouTube channel and got me to be in front of your faces right now. And if you're new here, I'd love it if you subscribed. I wanna give a huge thanks to Christopher Lang, Lori Timms, Billy Bombs, Everett Parrott, Havelock Smiggles, It's Quintly, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lenowski, Sonali Manka, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who support me over on patreon.com slash nerdsync. Link in the description. Click a tap right here to learn why Spider-Man and Doctor Strange make the same hand gesture, or click right here for something else. I don't know what it is. Once again, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya. Okay, this has been uh, horrible. Bye forever.